education, uh, including analytical chemistry and physics. And the running joke is I'm a biologist in an analytical chemist world. And it also, the, the biology background also was a critical piece as an EMT in ski patrol because my understanding of anatomy and physiology really helps with understanding the pathophysiology of different injury types and disease states. So you're probably thinking, what, what can mass spec tell me? And there's so many, so many applications of mass spec. Um, everything from anytime you've gone to the doctor and they take blood and they, and they do different tests, Sometimes when those samples go to LabCorp and Quest, they, they actually do run uh, mass spec on that. And so that will be part of like the clinical, clinical side of things. Um, there's also, uh, like I already talked about the forensic applications. So kind of like Abby and NCIS, uh, any doping like, you know, with different uh, sport, professional sports um, a big, big hot area right now is cannabis testing, QA, QC. Um, that's like a, a multi-billion dollar industry starting. Um, but also, but primarily today, I'm going to talk to you about proteomics because that's that's what I do. So, um, biology. I, you know, I think it, for the biologists here, I, I don't think I think this goes without saying that biology is so complex. Um, and this is just like a snapshot of metabolism. And we can use mass spectrometry to understand the complex biology of disease and find possible biomarkers. For those of you that have had biochemistry, some of this might look familiar, like this is the TCA cycle and you know, lipid metabolism. So you know, biology is complex and, and we can use a tool like mass spec to start to understand some of these diseases. And so this is the part where I, you know, segment into the proteomic side. So uh, I like to show this slide because I, I remember when I was, this is probably going to date me, but I remember when I was an undergrad, Craig Ventner came to West Virginia University and it was around the time he was about to wrap up sequencing the human genome. And I remember getting so excited because we were going to unlock the understanding of disease and that's the missing puzzle piece to understand cancer. We're going to cure cancer and, and, um, and, and looking back, it's kind of funny of how naive that thought process was because it only opened up a Pandora's box. I mean, it's so complex, just, you know, you can go from 20,000 genes and DNA goes to RNA, which translate to protein. And, um, you know, RNA being kind of like the contractor reading the blueprint, which is the DNA to make the protein. And even the different proteins, there's so many different isoforms of a protein that might come from a single gene. And then you add on there, the complexity just grows from there with what we call post-translational modifications, which is just a fancy word for the proteins get little decorations that change their function. So um, just to talk about, we call it shotgun proteomics. Um, why, why it's called that is because we can take a sample, which whether it's tissue, whole tissue lysate, cell lysate, um, and we can grind it up and I call it like a, you know, a smoothie, you know, a, a, like a tissue smoothie. And we get this complicated uh, sample that we extract the proteins from. I like to use the analogy that, you know, for one protein, if you imagine a 1000 piece puzzle, that's one protein. And then you take 1000 of 1000 piece puzzles and then you mix it all together and each puzzle piece being a peptide. We're then taking that puzzle piece and trying to match it back to what protein that is. Um, so it, it can be quite complicated and, and we rely a lot on database searching. But the, the spectrum we get is a unique fingerprint to that peptide. Um, but then we do the spectral matching. So that would be a discovery workflow where we don't know what we're looking for. We just say, what can we see? And then sometimes we can infer back 
and say, hey, I'm, you know, I found HNF4 alpha. It's a really interesting protein. I want to target that. Um, so a lot of times we do a discovery, we find proteins that are changing, and then we go back and, and specifically quantitate that protein. Um, so it, so one of the, um, one thing I, you know, I know we're mostly outdoor people. Uh, I, I know I personally like to go outside and look at the stars and my, my boss, he, he likes to compare proteomics to astronomy. And I, and I know it sounds a little, a little funny, but bear with me here. Um, but this analogy uh, provides a pretty good uh, explanation of proteomics. And uh, there's different factors that can determine what you can observe. And so in astronomy, you know, looking up at space, we can't look at all of space at once. It's impossible. It goes on infinitely. Um, same with proteomics. Uh, we, unlike genomics, we cannot amplify protein. So what we see is what we see. And a lot of times when we start looking at samples, we're looking at the most abundant proteins. But if there were some specific biomarkers that we were interested in, we might have to look at a subfraction of the proteome and, and to target those specific groups. So just like in astronomy, we have to look at a specific region in space. The objects themselves. So um, just, like, just like stars, um, different factors of whether or not you see that star, how, how bright is it? How far away is it? What, what is the chemical makeup um, of whether or not we will see that here? on earth. And similarly in proteomics, it, it depends on what, you know, a lot of times people are like, hey, can you see this protein? And we'll tell them, well, it depends. What's the abundance? Um, what's the sequence of that protein? What are the physical properties? Um, we're ionizing the sample, so it, we have to be able to get enough signal for it to be detected. And also having those post-translational modifications can impact if we see that protein. Um, different things can interfere. Um, so just like in astronomy, we're not gonna go look at the stars in the daylight. That's silly, right? You know, all we're gonna see is one star, it's the sun. Um, and, and also, you know, if it, it's, if we are trying to go outside in the city, all we're gonna, you know, that light pollution might cause problems. So. Similarly in proteomics, um, sometimes there's really abundant proteins that just swamp out the signal. Uh, for example, um, blood, like plasma. It's a really important biofluid, but uh, albumin is the bane of my existence. It's the, the most abundant protein in plasma. It makes up 97% of the protein concentration and just like trying to do astronomy in the daylight, I have to remove that albumin to possibly see important biomarker proteins. And uh, depending on where you look and how you look um, will determine how successful you are, whether you're just doing a, a global proteomics to see what you see or if you're doing targeted. Um, so I know it sounds like a silly comparison, but it, it really helps with understanding proteomics. So the, the biggest thing our, our lab um, does is what's called global quantitative proteomics. Um, and we use this method called differential mass spec, which is just a, a fancy word of saying um, how it works is, is if we have samples that are treated or not treated, most of the proteins are the same we're just finding a subset of proteins that are changing. And, and one of the, going back to the space example, um, these, these two photos were actually taken by someone in their, in their backyard. And um, they're, they're actually different, uh, the two photos. And I'm gonna point to you in a second, what's the difference between the two photos? But I think it kind of goes back to the theme of astronomy that for the most part, this picture looks the same. So just like I had said, you know, most of the proteins will be about the same and we're just trying to find 
one protein is changing. And, and this pitcher just happened to pick up a supernova um, during an exposure. So basically we're, we're finding a needle in the proteomics haystack. We're getting several thousands of identified proteins and we're just trying to pluck out just a, a few handful of proteins that are changing that our collaborators can go and validate. And um, it comes down to a really good study design. And also the secret is the software. And our software um, aligns all the peaks from all the, the files over. And we can have over half a million features that are collected during the analysis. And then we apply statistics to find the proteins changing between the two groups. And um, all these um, have led to pretty high impact um, publications. Um, it, they were just a lot of our collaborators are like, hey, I have these samples. These are the two groups, what's changing? And they, we usually give them a list and then we don't see them for about three years. And then they come back and want to publish because they validated their findings. So it's kind of like a fishing trip. And which segments into the next part? So um, this is this is the, this is the really this has been the most challenging and rewarding, um, I think, research of my whole career so far, um, and it's a proteomic approach to discover um, viruses that cause cancer. And this is this is the study that literally, like, I just approved the proofs today, fresh off the press hasn't even hit paper yet. It's, it's only available online right now, but um, just, just was accepted on October 15th. But this is, um, I think, the best example of how powerful this differential mass spectrometry can be. And, and joining this lab, I was kind of skeptical, like how well does it actually work? And this proof of concept really demonstrates it. And this was in collaboration with Tuna uh, Topton. She, she was a postdoc at Hill, the Hillman Cancer Center here in Pittsburgh, and she has moved back to Germany. Um, she finished her postdoc and now is at um, Frankfurt. And Pat and Huan, they are a husband-wife pair. Um, they are virologists and epidemiologists that uh, in their career, uh, they, they said there's 11 known pathogens that are uh, known to cause cancer. They have discovered two of them. They're in the National Academy of Science for discovering them for the Merkel cell polyomavirus and Kaposi sarcoma associated herpes virus. And uh, to, give, to give you a little background of this project, uh, like I said, 15% of worldwide cancers are caused by oncogenic viruses. And their prevalence that it could change if depending on socioeconomic conditions and especially in immunocompromised patients. So patients that don't have a very good immune system and Merkel cell polyomavirus, uh, it's part of your natural flora. Like it's probably living on your skin right now. Um, and it's just in populations that don't have a very good immune system. Uh, they have a higher chance of getting this cancer and they're, they're epidemiologists. They, they firmly believe that though there's 11 known pathogens and there's an estimated 15% of worldwide cancers caused by viruses, they believe that we haven't even scratched the surface. They think because of the immune system involvement in cancer, there are so many more to discover. And the ones they discovered were based on DNA and RNA based approaches but they think the continued success of that is hindered by the low abundance of the viral host RNA and DNA in the tissue. And so uh, the, cha the challenge to, to, to differentiate between host proteins and viral proteins, they think is a, a good approach for trying with mass spec. And so, so they approached us and said, hey, can we, can we try your approach to see if we can um, look at, try to find a new virus. And before we did that, we decided to um, do a, a proof of concept study doing a known system. And so 
like I had said earlier, uh, typically how we, how we move is from DNA to RNA to protein to make our proteomic databases. But in the event you're trying to find a new virus and you don't have the DNA sequence or any sequence at all, we actually did this in reverse. So this DPS method goes from protein and then we figured out the RNA transcript and then related that back to the DNA. So we're, we're doing everything a little backwards. And this is the overview of the, what we call the digital peptide subtra subtraction method. Uh, there's three main parts of it and I'm going to, to go into each part separately in a little bit more detail. Um, so first I'm gonna talk about the sample prep. Um, the patient samples were blinded. So these were all cancer samples. And the only difference was whether or not they had virus. So viral positive or viral negative. I had no idea which one was which. And um, what was so cool about this project, it, they were actually from what's called formalin fixed paraffin embedded samples. And basically if, if you ever had a biopsy done and they take a, a biopsy, they'll, they'll put it in formalin fix and then they'll embed it in what's in a wax. And the, the benefit of doing that, you get really, uh, then they'll stain it and then do their diagnosis. But the benefit of this FFPE tissue, it's good forever. Like you can archive FFPE tissue. Like I've, I've seen papers where they've taken a hundred year old FFPE tissue and was still able to get protein out of it. So they're archivable. And um, so it makes it clinical samples a lot easier to work with. And then from there, I, I removed the wax, the protein was extracted. We made a complex, you know, we digested the sample into peptides and analyzed them by mass spec. And after the analysis, there was about 18,000 peptides from 2,800 proteins that were human. And we threw that information out. Um, where we weren't interested in, in human proteins, we're trying to find a virus. So what remained was about 500,000 features that were quantified. And then now I'm gonna talk about how we did the data analysis. So after taking that half a million features, we, we just applied statistics from there. Our bioinformatics um, coworker, she uh, did a statistical test on it, just a, a, a binary student t-test. After that, um, we deter determine what features were significant. And in this case, a p-value less than 0.01 and a full change greater than 10 and rank them by that p-value. And after so after having 500,000 features, it narrowed down to about 500 features. And then from there, we rank them by this p-value. And, and this was looking at the full change. Basically, we were looking at a change going from negative to positive in an upregulation. So after having that, those 20 features, I told the mass spec, this is that targeted method I was mentioning, like, hey, I want you to look at those features and, and target them for sequencing. And what makes this so unique? Uh, typically, you would have a database and you would get a spectrum, a theoretical spectrum, or your experimental spectrum is then compared to a theoretical spectrum and it's just a matching algorithm. Uh, in this case, I don't have a sequence, I don't have a database. So it's called de novo. And, and if you look up the definition of de novo, it's, it's a Latin adverb for a new from the beginning. And so this is what a, an MSMS spectra looks like. And there, there's, so this is, this is what the pioneers of mass spec used to do. They would sit there and look at the spectra and then manually sequence before databases. And, and this is like a, a giant puzzle. So if you like puzzles, this is like a, a giant crossword puzzle I, that I sat down with a pencil and a calculator and manually sequence these spectra. And for example, um, 
looking at B2 to B3, that's a distance of 129. Now, if you have taken biochemistry or you, if you remember your amino acids and your residue mass, uh, 129 is glutamic acid, that's E. And if you look at B3 to B4, that's 163, that's tyrosine. Yes, I have them all memorized because I've done this so long doing the de novo sequencing for months and weeks on end, um, you start to memorize the, the amino acid residues. Now it, it's not completely perfect. You, there are sometimes gap in the spectrum where there's just not enough information. So um, like the B ions go one way, the Y ions go the other way and it's like a giant puzzle. And once you get a sequence tag, um, what, what I was able to do is I handed those sequences to Tuna. Some of those we blast searched because we already knew this virus. And um, coincidentally, out of those top 20, four came back as the virus. Um, so that was actually pretty remarkable in itself that you know some of those did come up as human. And again, we tossed those we weren't interested. But taking those, that, that I about fell out of my chair whenever I saw the out of the top 24 of them being from the virus. And just to, to prove that we could go backwards, she then took that information and um, took that sequencing information, got the RNA transcripts, and then traced backwards to DNA. And um, looking at the different, the four peptides after going back, this is the actual sequence. And I, I'm not a virologist and I'm certainly not an expert in this specific virus, but uh, she was showing where exactly on the genome those peptides, what, what gene it comes from. And the, these are the actual peptides. And if you, this is the mass spec data in the scatter plots. And when you look, um, this being zero, uh, you can see there is a, a pretty big change between the MCV negative samples that didn't have virus and the MCV positive. And we, we had said that a p-value less than 0.01 was considered statistically significant. And these are really low p-values. Like this one's e to the minus 19. That's really significant. And that was the top hit. Um, the, the, first, the very first viral peptide based on the p-value. Um, so, you know, this is going back to the, the 17,000 peptides that were human that we threw out. Um, in the event that you didn't find a, a pathogen um, based on this, this method going backwards, uh, we can also infer any kind of biological information about what changes are occurring with the protein, uh, with human proteins. And so um, out of those 2,800 human proteins that were quantified after doing the statistical analysis, 46 of those human proteins had a significant change. So this is that needle in the haystack, uh, only 46 proteins were changing. And this method here is called immunohistochemistry staining. And basically what that is, is you, when you have a tissue section and you want to probe and see if that specific protein is there and where in the tissue, um, you can use this immunohistochemistry and it's specific to that protein. So if you, if you look at the, the top row, that's the Merkel cell polyoma, or that's that's the cancer samples with the, the virus. And then these are the, the same cancer samples without virus. And the first panel is she probed for the actual virus itself and just demonstrated when you see this brown color, that means the protein is there. And then um, looking at other human proteins that are changing, uh, for example, serpin B5 and trim 29, those proteins based on our statistical analysis showed a downregulation with, with the viral positive samples. So, um, and, and the immunohistochemistry validated that. So 
here you see a lot of brown staining in the, the without virus. And then, uh, so you see the brown stain and then with viral, with the virus, you see that color disappear. So pretty, it was pretty remarkable. This is, this is when I became a firm believer in, in DMS. Um, this is one of the first projects I worked on when I first joined the lab. And so just to summarize some of the key points, we can, we can use an unbiased proteomics approach to discover, to discover novel viruses without prior knowledge of that viral sequence. And that's what we call digital peptide subtraction. We're currently working with them on another cancer model, um, looking to see if we can find uh, a novel protein or novel virus, excuse me. Uh, this was just a proof of concept study to demonstrate that we can do it. And we did that with the MCV positive or negative Merkel cell carcinoma patient samples. And then also if no pathogen is found, this workflow can reveal um, possible biomarkers to understand uh, the disease and, and maybe even improve patient diagnosis. diagnosis. So um, this is the part I, I just wanted to um, talk a, about, you know, different, for those of you that are biologists that are thinking about what to do with your degree, um, I wanted to give some information between industry and academic, because coming, coming from both, like in my career, um, I'm, a, I'm kind of an outlier only having a bachelor's degree. Uh, with that being said, it just graduate school never worked out for me in my own career. And I've just worked really, really extremely hard to get where I am. Um, but just these numbers might be a little bit of a shock um, of what to expect. I got these numbers from Glassdoor and, and that number also depends on like where in the country you go and the cost of living. Keep that in mind. If you see a high salary, check the cost of living. Um, but Typically with just a bachelor's degree coming into research, um, it's, it's gonna be like a, a lower salary. Uh, I, I will always encourage people to continue your education, um, but also, you know, it, your, your salary will also depend on your years of experience. So if you, if you can get into a lab when you're undergrad, I highly encourage you to do so. Because um, experience, it's not just what you know, it's getting experience. And also just some other ideas. Uh, you don't, I, some of the best sales reps I've met in my, in my career have science backgrounds because we can talk science and then, you know, I, we know, we understand each other and, it, and it's a lot easier to have a conversation with someone that has a science background. Um, some new, new and emerging fields um, that I didn't really get a chance to talk about because of time, but bioinformatics and biostatisticians are so important. Like, so if you love math, it's a huge growing field right now, especially with uh, the precision medicine initiative. Um, we're now using more of a computational approach to diagnose disease where we're doing multiple test testing and and so that, that area is exploding. Um, so if you love math and you love statistics, I highly recommend looking into that. But also from a continuing education, some of my friends had gone on and gotten their MBA and they're now project managers for like pharmaceutical companies. So they manage a whole team. So they have a science background, but yet like they're managing an entire team. And also, if you're thinking about medical school or some other professional school, I highly recommend looking into maybe even doing an MD, PhD, because it's the, more and more as you get to bigger institutions and you're trying to be a doctor, they're, they're going to, a lot of big institutions require you to do research as well. And having that MD, PhD, it's, it's extra schooling, but it goes a long way. Um, in terms of getting into those big institutions and also a higher salary. And also 
patent lawyers, I, you know, I remember when I was an undergrad, one of my professors saying, listen, go out, get your law degree, become a patent attorney. It's a really boring job, but you make a lot of money because, you know, there's so much technology coming out and it's being patented. And we need lawyers that have science backgrounds to help translate. Now, I'm going to talk about like the different pros and cons between industry and academic research. Um, keep in mind, this is, this is based on my experience. So uh, every, everybody's experience is different. Um, and mine might be a little bit skewed because I was in a star small startup company in the beginning. And now I'm in a core facility. So this is take it with a grain of salt. This is just one person's experience. But um, in terms of the pros, industry is a lot more fast paced. Uh, you have to be, you have to have the ability to quickly learn and expand and adapt. Uh, the trade-off is it generally pays pretty well. And there's other incentives like profit sharing, stock options, bonuses, um, that just, you know, you have your base salary, but sometimes these on these additional incentives on top of that um, can help you grow like financially. Um, there's also clear career advancement potential. You know, I'm a lab tech and then I become a lab manager and then I, you know, like you slowly work your way up. Um, some of the cons, it's, it can be very regimented and very limited on your innovative creativity, unless you're in research and development. But a lot of times it's, hey, follow this SOP and thou shalt not deviate, because then that's more paperwork. Um, it's also at will, so there's always the threat of a possible potential layoff, um, and it could just happen at any time, depending on so many different things. The, the company decided to go a different direction. Um, another con is some of your work might be confidential and not published. Um, some of the really cool stuff I've worked on, I can't even talk about, because uh, I, I signed a non-disclosure agreement, and I have to be tight-lipped, you know, some of the pros of academic environment, the ability to think outside of the box. Um, you can create new, new procedures, techniques, technology, sometimes even maybe patent that, patent that idea. Um, from a, a benefits perspective, um, health benefits can be comparable and sometimes in depending, depending on your institution really. Um, but you know, I know for me, for, I'm really fortunate at Pitt that we have really good health benefits and retirement compensation. Um, there's also, depending on the institution, sometimes there's tuition discount, not just for you, but for spouses and dependents. So if you're thinking about kids someday, um, sometimes those are some benefits of work being in an academic environment. If you like, if you like seeing your name on things, publications are huge. Um, it, it never gets old for me. I, when I see my name in print, like you see all the hard work that led up to that point and you know, you're, you're pouring your heart and your soul into something and it's cool to see your name on it. It never gets old. Um, I said flexible schedule, but that also depends on your PI. I'm really fortunate at the BioMS Center that we have a really uh, family friendly work environment and even more so with the pandemic. Uh, where, you know, if, if we don't have lab work, we're allowed to just stay home and, and do desk work at home. But that depends on your PI. Um, some of the cons, you know, there's less room to grow in professional positions without furthering your education. Not having a master's or PhD, I'm going to hit a glass ceiling eventually. Um, and, and, you know, for me, that's okay. I, you know, I get a lot of fulfillment doing ski patrol and other things. So for me, I'm okay. <laughs> and the salary range is generally super rigid because we are based on grant money. So, you know, even being in a high tech area, um, unfortunately, you know, there's only so much the university can give me because of NIH funding. We get our funding from NIH and NSF. So they would love to give me all the salary in the world, but you know, there's a cap just because of you know, money. And then with that, I just wanted to summarize that it's, it's, you know, I can't stress this enough. It's super important to be well-rounded as a scientist and 
you know, if you're thinking of, if you're seriously thinking about research, you know, try to tailor your curriculum to what your interests are. And, and really it, it, hands-on experience is so important. Um, I, I literally knocked on every single PI's door in my department in undergrad until I found Jen. And that was the best experience just, just to get that lab experience. And with anything, there's pros and cons to working in industry and academic. Um, and it, it all depends on what works for you. And I hope I convinced you that mass spec, it's a really exciting field to be a part of. And if you want more information about mass spectrometry, uh, you can check out asms.org. And they have all kinds of information, including uh, more background and what mass spec is. And, and, I, and they even have like a career portal, portal to find jobs. And with that, I just want, I'm just going to wrap it up. And, and this, is, this is my favorite photo because, you know, this is our team and it was when my worlds collided for just one day. And it was like, so cool. Like, this is my, this is my director, Dr. Nathan Yates. He's probably just as much of a skier as I am, uh, except I'm a snowboarder. I forgot to mention that. I'm one of the few snowboarders on patrol. We do not discriminate. Um, and, and it was cool to have our lab come for a day to ski. And with that, I, I will take any questions. I'll turn back on my video. Pam, we have about five questions that are in the chat. Sure. Um, so we could read them to you or- Oh, okay. I'm, I'm new to this. Okay. The okay. Button all the way down. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess the first one's from Robert. If mass spec is yep. being used to help us better understand diseases, are you aware of any research currently? Oh, that's a good question. Yes. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, I think his name is Keegan or Kagan um, at UCSF. Uh, they were. They're one of the uh, big institutions that was on the, the COVID research. And from the very beginning, um, sorry that my video is so glitchy, <laughs> um, but th they were finding even proteins that were changing. One thing that was a little alarming, but they, they had found a lot of kinases that were changing, which kinases are proteins that phosphorylate. And um, they were actually using chemotherapy kinase inhibitors to inhibit the virus uh, in animal studies. Like they did that in isolation. And they actually were some of the first ones to start characterizing what proteins are changing, how, what, what drugs can we use to inhibit. Um, so it, I, would, I would definitely check out UCSF. I think it's Kagan. K-A-G-A-N. Um, also, our group, by proximity, basically, we're on the ninth floor, and we share the floor with the Center for Vaccine Research um, here at Pitt. And so um, we, I, I haven't personally, but a lot of members of our team have been working with Paul Dupree directly and because Paul's group works with the virus, the live virus in, in isolation. And um, our, our colleague, Yi Shi, has been looking at nanobodies inhibiting the virus. So like they're little tiny antibodies. Um, so there, there's a lot of really exciting things happening with mass spec and, and COVID. Um, there was a question about doing shotgun using microflow. Yes. So a lot of the work that I did previously at, at the small startup company was all microflow. Um, the lab that I work in now, it's nanoflow. So we're looking at like 300 nanoliters per minute. And, and the benefits of doing that is less solvent. Um, so that also makes it cheaper because you're not going through as much solvent and also uh, during the ionization process, um, you have less um, neutral species coming through because the it's, it, it becomes kind of technical, but there's a lot less, uh, the electric spray is a lot steadier. Um, let's 
So the success, most successful breakthrough, I think, is the one I already talked about. Um, that I mean, I literally fell out of my chair. I was so excited to see that the top, out of the top twenty, because you know, honestly, going into the project, I was like, "Is this going to work?" Like, you know, I was a little skeptical. Um, this is this actually going to work? And and when it when it did, it just literally knocked my socks off. I fell off my chair. Um, Let's see, what sciences are involved in proteomics? Is it a highly collaborative field? Oh, yes. Um, even especially now with COVID, I feel like. Um, we, so our, our BioMS center is not just the center and, and, and me and a few others working with, um, we work with people at Pitt and UPMC. So, you know, my job is, you know, part of my job is our team meets with investig principal investigators and they come to us with a scientific question and, um, and then we, we design experiments around exactly what they're trying to accomplish. Um, and uh, so it, I mean, I've, I've, <laughs> I've had some weird samples. I've had um, really interesting questions. Like I, one one that I remember just off the top of my head was there someone was looking at like what proteins are changing in tears based on how you cry and like there was proteins changing depending on if you were like a happy crying or like a sad crying and and it was it was kind of kind of interesting um and I would say even within our group besides the center we also have um, people in psychiatry and cell biology that share the space with us that are doing their own thing and um, we share ideas and and COVID has changed a lot of our landscape we have to do it virtual now but um, so even though we're in the same space we don't always get to see each other now um, does FFPE process affect the quality of DNA that's being obtained from embedded tissue it actually can I think it, it impacts DNA or F RNA more. Um, and I think that was one of the reasons why we wanted to look at proteins specifically. Um, they also, you know, I'm not a virologist, so um, pardon me if I, I misspeak, but um, it's my understanding that also with the DNA and RNA, um, you have to hope that it was actively replicating in order to catch that DNA change. Um, if it was in a latency period, it was my under, my interpretation that if that virus goes silent and stops replicating because eventually, like sometimes viruses, they'll stop rel replicating because they don't want the immune system to detect them. And so if it goes to that latency period, um, then hopefully you caught it when, you're, when the tissue is collected. Um, but it was my understanding that the proteins accumulate and that's why one of the reasons why it would be even more successful than DNA and RNA. Was there any more questions? I think that those are the only ones written down. Yeah, yeah. Well, um... Emily, do you have anything else or are we good? Um, thank you, Pam, um, very much. And uh, class is over for the few <laughs> students that came. Thank and, you very much. And I wanna say thank you so much. I know you guys have the day off and, and, and thank you for tuning in. Like, I really appreciate that. <laughs> Thanks so much for your time, Pam. We really appreciate you coming today. No problem. Thank you.